free. Have you ever used the phrase, what does it matter? I'm sure you have at different times in different contexts. Now, generally speaking, when that phrase is spoken, that phrase usually anticipates a negative answer. I mean, does it matter if you only have $5 when you need 100000 I mean, what does it matter, right? Does it matter all that much if you are at the ice cream shop and you choose peppermint bonbon over cookie dough? No, no big deal because this decision, the decision in and of itself relative to ice cream doesn't matter all that much. There's no eternal consequence in it. And there's no question that at different times and at different situations, some things do not matter all that much. Some things are trivial. But then on the other hand, some things are not. Some things are very, very weighty. Now, I'm not talking about those times when you made mountains out of molehills, later only to see and to really realize that you overreacted and that the thing that you thought was a big deal really wasn't a big deal. Our problem is more, I think, that it's possible for us to fail to see that the opposite is true, that there's things that God says in light of eternity that are very important, and you might perceive them as unimportant, as trivial, not worth your consideration. And that could spell trouble. See, when the question is asked, does it really matter, is asked to the believer in Jesus Christ relative to how he or she lives on earth, the answer is it matters to the nth degree. Your decisions matter in light of eternity. Eternity is in every moment. It's in each one of our decisions to some degree or another. Now, you might think, well, wait a minute. You just told, I just told you that it doesn't matter if you choose cookie dough or peppermint bonbon. Well, that's true in and of itself. But God looks beyond the surface to the heart behind the decision. See, we've gone over this verse before. It says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all of the glory of God. And that even can be taken down to which ice cream you pick. The flavor really doesn't matter, but your attitude and your approach to it really does. We're to do all things for the glory of God. It's a very simple yet profound verse to remind us that even the little things matter from God's perspective. And our life is to be a tribute to God's grace. In fact, our, our mind should, sh mindset should be the same as the Apostle Paul. He says, I don't care if I live, I don't care if I die, I want Christ to be magnified in my body. That's how we are to think 24-7. You see, unfortunately, in the mind of some, it may not be perceived that way. Some have taken the biblical principle and the biblical fact of eternal security and used it to draw a wrong conclusion. The one who has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation, we know biblically is never in danger of losing that salvation because of what Christ did for them on the cross. He cried out, it is finished. But then the conclusion is wrongfully drawn. Well, then it really doesn't matter how I live my life then. You know, I wonder if those who subscribe to that philosophy think that their decisions didn't matter prior to salvation. I wonder if they thought the same way prior to salvation. You know, one of the lame arguments against eternal security is, well, if eternal security is true, you can go out and do whatever you want, and, or as some have phrased, you can go out and live like hell, and it really doesn't matter. Now, is that a true statement? Well, uh, in one sense, that is a true statement, and yet in another sense, it is not a true statement. I recall a situation when I was having a discussion with a lady who believes that you had to be good to go to heaven. Her reasoning went as follows. She said, you mean if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and then live a raunchy life, that you get to go to heaven? She goes, I don't buy it. You can go out and maim and kill and rape and still go to heaven? She said, I know people like you who believe like that, and they're some of the rudest people I know. And I told her I agree that no one should live their lives like that. But then I said, tell me, if you, if you think one 
who doesn't do those things, they don't go out and maim and kill and rape, does this mean they deserve to go to heaven? Are they worthy of entering heaven? Does not doing those things guarantee that you will go to heaven when you die? Well, she said, how can they say they're Christians when they live like that? And that was really a diversion tactic of hers. I tried to tell her, and I was unsuccessful, that how one lives their life has no bearing on whether they go to heaven or not. And though she would never dream of, in her own mind of doing these deplorable things, as she said, what she refused to see is that she didn't live up to God's standards either. See, the issue when it comes to being saved from sin's penalty is not your behavior. Because none of us make the grade. All of us fall short. None of us measure up. It's impossible. In fact, what do we read here in Romans 3, verse 22? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference from God's perspective. None have made the grade. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, it doesn't matter if your pattern of behavior more closely resembles Mother Teresa or more closely resembles Adolf Hitler. None of us have made the grade. There is no difference. Now, someone might argue, you're not going to compare me with the likes of Adolf Hitler or maybe even this young man who killed 17 kids in that school shooting here in Parkland, Florida just a week or so ago. See, the issue isn't a relative comparison. The issue is God's standard. God has the standard. God does the evaluation. His evaluation is perfect. And he says there is no difference because none of us have made the grade. And this is why the grace of God is such a wonderful thing. Notice verse 24. Being justified freely. Free means free. Free to you and me, though it costs Christ everything. By the grace. It's freely by God's amazing grace, which means he gives something to the undeserving. But it was through something. What? The redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Propitiation. What is it? The appeasement or turning away of God's wrath against sinners by the means of an atoning sacrifice. Christ paid our bill in full. The penalty of sin was paid for all by the grace of God so we can be declared righteous free because God's justice was satisfied by another, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. And so what's Paul's conclusion, verse 28? We conclude that a man is justified. The word justified means declared righteous. How? By faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Apart from your law keeping. Apart from keeping the deeds of the law. All of us have fallen short. The issue is not how far short have you fallen. The question is not are you as bad as you could be. The question is you are bad enough. Or that's the answer, rather. You are bad enough and you need Jesus Christ. We're all born in Adam, separated from God, in desperate need of a Savior. So your behavior is not the issue. The issue is there's nothing you can do to remove your sin and that's why Christ came. And so the issue is not how, to, how you live your life prior to salvation because it's absolutely free. But it's funny, after you're, you're saved, how you live your life matters. Isn't that interesting? It does matter. Not for reasons someone might think. But you see, you're saved by grace. It was through faith. Faith is non-meritorious. It's only as good as what you put it in. If you put it in Christ, since his work was perfect, the outcome is guaranteed. This is why Christ said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, that's everybody who comes to him, I will never cast out. Never means never. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but I'll raise it up at the last day. End of story. You know, if you understand the grace of God, you should express your thanks to God that your salvation is not predicated on your faithfulness or you wouldn't be saved. You'd never make it. But once you're saved, because God wants your life to count and because you're going to stand and give an account one day, your decisions matter.
they matter. Now let me clarify something. There's those who do say that how you live your life after you're saved matter, but they make the issue the wrong one. They say you must live a righteous life to maintain your salvation. That's not what the scripture says. They'll say you have to live a righteous life to prove that you are saved. Or some will say you have to live a righteous life to not lose that salvation. And nothing can be further from the truth. That way, if that was true, then your salvation would not be predicated on Christ's faithfulness, but yours. And if it's predicated on yours, it's already over. Now, occasionally I hear someone say, you know, if they were really saved, they wouldn't live like that. Well, apparently they haven't read the book of 1 Corinthians. You know, apparently they don't realize that David committed adultery and murder, but he didn't lose his salvation. He did lose the joy of salvation. There were other consequences that he had to deal with because there's a fixed principle in life. You reap what you sow. Now, some would even say that since there's not a discernible change in the life and that <clears throat> you still sin the nasty nine or dirty dozen, that you're not saved. You know, I remember hearing a popular preacher on the radio say once, giving out what he called the ABCs of salvation. A is for all have sinned, B is believe in Christ, and C was consider the cost. Wrong. And he proceeded to use verses to describe what he would consider to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And he quoted Luke 6.46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Well, if everyone was held to that standard, who would make it? Nobody would. We all violate what the Lord says. You know, in order to rightly divide the word of truth, you need to know the biblical difference between a believer and a faithful disciple. Salvation is free, but the Bible is clear if you're going to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, and there's a difference, it will cost you something. Oftentimes what is missed by some who teach the word of God is they mix and match first tense salvation principles with second tense salvation principles. They combine the two. Justification happens at a point in time. Sanctification is a process over time for those that have been saved by the grace of God. They don't make that distinction. The goal is obviously to walk in a way that matches your position in Christ, but that's secondary to salvation, not primary. But make no mistake, how you live your life after you're saved is very, very important. And so we've been asking the question, the last few messages, though the one who has been genuinely saved by God's grace through placing his complete trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ can't lose his salvation, what can he lose? You do stand to lose something. That potential exists. And so on your handout, if you've trusted in Christ alone, your salvation is eternal and secure, but you can lose, first of all, your reward in heaven. Your reward in heaven. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, what God wants all of us to understand is that you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. And when you got saved, you made a decision to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for you paid for your sins in full, was buried and rose again, and you put 100% of your trust in him, and you received eternal life. At that point in time, you were born with a sin nature, became an old sin nature. God gave you a new nature, which has a natural affinity to the things of God and the word of God, and he gave you the Holy Spirit so you can understand the things of God and then be empowered to live a life consistent with God's grace in a way that glorifies Jesus Christ in a way that bears fruit for him. 
Whoops. This is your privilege. This is God's goal with you. And so as you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, as you take in the word of God and learn to walk by faith, increasingly you're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and this is what your life looks like. However, you, sin nature didn't roll over and die. Though it was condemned by the work of Jesus Christ, it's still alive and well. And so the issue always in the thinking of every individual is who am I going to present myself to? If you present yourself to that sin nature, sin nature only always has one objective. It's me first. And what that looks like is either sin or self-righteousness. And this, all of this is unacceptable to God. Because it stems from a problem called your sin nature, which is corrupt. Nothing your sin nature can produce is acceptable or honorable to God because in your flesh dwells, finish it, no good thing. And so the issue is, are you walking by means of the Spirit? Are you walking by faith? Are you walking in dependence upon Christ? Or are you enamored with yourself and how you look and how you're perceived and what you can do so that people stand up and notice you? That's the battle. And when you recognize that the problem is not my selfishness, the problem is my sin nature, and the manifestation of that sin nature is drunkenness, strife, murder, selfishness, adultery, fornication, hate, witchcraft, anger. You can take your pick. The problem is the root. And so you have to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto that sin nature and alive unto God according to Romans 6. And when you're willing to walk in dependence upon the Lord and present yourself to him, the Holy Spirit can then empower you, motivated by love, to have the fruit of the Spirit manifested in your life. Kindness, patience, peace, joy, faithfulness, generosity, gentleness, self-control, love, all these things that are considered fruit that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. It's your privilege to do that. Now, why these things matter is because of what we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. Paul says we make it our goal, our aim, to please Christ, whether we're at home in the body or away from it, for why? We, that's all believers, must, this is not an option, appear, saw this last time, means to be turned inside out. to be totally revealed, to be stripped naked before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one, every believer, no one's exempt, is going to receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. And the word bad, we saw in this Greek word phalos, it means worthless. Every believer is going to give an account. And so after the rapture, when we stand before Christ, Every one of our post-salvation lives is going to be evaluated. And there's something at stake for every believer. It's called a crown. So your post-salvation life will be evaluated, and you can have a crown of life for believers that are faithful unto death that endure trials, a crown of righteousness for believers that are faithful in doing God's will, a crown of glory is for faithful pastors who are faithful in their ministry. We all stand to gain these things. We need to remember, though, the judgment seat of Christ is not a time in which the Lord will mete out punishment for sins committed as a child of God. The punishment for those sins was fully borne by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And so the issue is going to be rewards or loss of rewards depending on how you used your life for the Lord. Salvation is a gift. Rewards are given for faithfulness in the Christian life. And they're lost when we don't take advantage of the opportunities that he's given us. And so work done and a spirit of dependence upon the Lord and faith in him is going to be honored. I like it. Amy Carmichael used to say that the work will never go deeper than we have gone ourselves. You have been given a volition. And so your decision to serve Christ, your motivation to do it, your diligence employed in doing so through God's strength is our responsibility. And this is what God sees as rewardable. This is what we read in, beginning in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 3. 
For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, these are your options, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work as a believer will become clear for the day, the day of Christ will declare it. It'll be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. Now, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Loss of what? Loss of reward. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. I mean, imagine for your moment that all your post-salvation deeds were turned into precious metals or trash and then torched. What would be left behind? When the fire goes out, life lived in carnality will go up in smoke. Now, the last time I spoke on this, I was asked a question, I think it was by Jesse. He said, what's the difference between a work that is considered good by God and a work that isn't? What's a work that counts and a work that doesn't count? A very good question. I mean, why does God want good works in the first place? What makes a work good? going to answer that here tonight, Lord willing. But why does God want good works in the first place? Why do they matter to him? Why should they matter to you? Well, let's look at a few. Good works are important for being a witness for Christ. How do we know? We're going to flop around our Bibles tonight. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5 to begin with. Matthew chapter 5. Notice beginning in verse 13. Christ said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. What's the point? Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, light and salt are things that penetrate and influence what they come in contact with. And as a blood-bought child of God, you and I have been left in this world by our Savior as his ambassadors to penetrate and influence the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. A faith that is demonstrated by good works provides a credible platform by which we can preach Christ. Our good works can help cause men to come and to be attracted to Christ and thus glorify God. And so good works are important for being a witness for Christ. This is God's perspective. How you conduct yourself matters. What else? Good works are how one expresses the love of Christ to the undeserving. We're in Matthew 5 here. Look at verse 43. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do even not tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do you not even tax collectors do so? He's hitting the low lives of society here. Therefore you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, Christ gave here raises the standard of love against the perverted religious standards of his day by telling his disciples to love their enemies by blessing them, by doing good to them, by praying for them. God says these good works reflect Christ in our life. They're important to him, and therefore they're to be important to us. We express the love of Christ to the undeserving. 
Good works are part of a worthy walk of faith. Go with me to Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, in praying for the Colossians, began in verse 9 by saying, For this reason we also, since the day we heard of your faith, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. To what end, verse 10? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. being fruitful in every good work, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. God wants you to understand what his will is, that you grow in the knowledge of him, so you would walk worthy of him, that you would be pleasing to him, and that you would be fruitful in every good work as you increase in the knowledge of God. This is part of God's will for you. This is an important part of a worthy walk. And so God says these things are important. But that's not all. He says good works are to be an expression of godliness in your Christian life. Turn over to 1 Timothy, chapter 2. 1 Timothy, chapter 2. Notice with me verses 9 and 10, and Paul here is addressing women in particular. He says, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves with modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with, notice, good works. Good works. God's perspective is that your external appearance should align with your internal character, which would manifest itself by two things, modest dress and good works. And so good works, from God's perspective, are the very thing that manifests true inner character, which is godliness. Professing godliness. So good works go hand in hand with godly living from Christ's perspective. What else? Good works are a means of, to lay hold of eternal life. You can turn over to chapter 6 in the same epistle. We'll pick it up in verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age, well, that would be everyone in this room, not to be haughty, nor to trust in the uncertainty of riches, which is easy to do, but we're to trust in who? The living God. Not a dead God, but a living God. And notice, he gives us all things richly to enjoy. What we have, he's given to us in love, enjoyment. But what are we to do, verse 18? Let them do good with what God has given us. God wants you to be rich, not monetarily, but in good works, ready to give, willing to share. What does that lead to, verse 19? Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. That's the time in heaven. This is how you lay hold of eternal life. See, the fact is you can take none of it with you, but you can send it on ahead by using it in light of eternity to benefit things that matter for eternity. That's how you lay hold of eternal life. God wants you to be rich in good works, to have a humble mindset, to trust in the security of the Lord and not in our riches. You know, it's always important to remember that if the Lord has given you riches, that he gave them to you. He wants you to enjoy them, but he wants you to use them for good purposes of sharing in the needs of others. And so he says, remind those. 
command those who are rich in this present age to use their riches for good and to share with others. So God says one of the reasons he's blessed you materially if he has is so that you can make a difference in someone else's life. Because he gave it to you in the first place. That perspective is very freeing. So this is how you lay hold of it. Good works are a way to lay hold of eternal life, to invest in eternity by using what God has given you to betterment someone else. What else do we know about good works? They're a byproduct of a sanctified life. Second Timothy chapter 2. We'll pick it up in verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that would be the dishonorable vessels, and that in this context is false teachers, you will be a vessel of the Lord for honor. Sanctified, it means set apart and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Sanctification of the Lord through study and occupation with God's word is to result in separation from false teaching and false teachers, allowing you to be an honorable vessel for the Lord and prepared by him, set apart unto him for every good work that he's left you here to do. God wants you to be a useful vessel of his, a servant, a tool, an implement is what the idea is. And so as you set yourself apart to him and are transformed by the renewing of your mind, you can better discern how God wants to use you to prove out his will as being a vessel of good works to others. This is important to God. Have you stopped and evaluated your life from the standpoint that I'm here to be a vessel of good works for the Lord? We default, because we live in America, and plus we have sin natures, to how can I squeeze the most out of whatever it is I got? And the Lord's saying, you know what? You're missing life if that's how you're thinking. You can make a difference in someone else's life, and that's what's going to go on to eternity. Not what you consumed, but what you gave. It's amazing. Good works are part of God's plan to deflect criticism of Christianity. Next book over is the book of Titus. Notice chapter 2. Verse 6. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober minded, and all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. So, in other words, if you're living a life that's set apart to the Lord. He's working in and through you. There's a pattern of good works in your life. Though the critics of Christianity are ever watching for you to fail and to blaspheme the Lord, as you are a person of integrity and do good works, that will deflect the criticism of Christianity. Because this is the devil's world. He's looking to find holes in everything that's associated with the Lord. And so the good works is something God has designed to be the very thing that deflects the criticism from the critics of Christianity. And this is especially important to the young men of Crete because of just the culture that existed there. And so God wants all of us to live in such a way that doesn't contradict the truths of the Bible or give opponents a reason to criticize the message of the gospel. Good works and a good testimony are the very thing God uses to that end. Good works are be the focus of our encouragement to one another. I'm going to keep going to the right here. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Verse 23, Hebrews 10. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our confession of our hope without wavering, for he, God, who promised, is faithful. And let us consider one another. To what end? To stir up one another. The King James says provoke. We're to stir up what? Love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and even so much the more as we see the day approaching. Here we're being exhorted to regularly assemble with each other for the purposes of encouraging and stimulating one another to love and good works. You know, God designed us as a body to be mutually encouraging to one another. As we gather together in fellowship and point one another to the Lord and learn the word of God together so we can stimulate one another spiritually. And good works are, are an important part of the function of the local body of believers. And the Hebrews needed this encouragement because of the persecution they were under. And so we're to encourage one another to love and good works. It's one of the privileges we have of gathering together. Good works are to be sacrificial. Sacrificial. In Hebrews 10 here, turn over to 13. Notice verse 15. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. We're to continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Verse 16. Do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. You know it's your privilege to sacrifice yourself for the betterment of others and for the glory of God and pleasing him. Now the Lord Jesus Christ said it's more blessed to give than receive. Satan is constantly whispering in your ear, it's more blessed to consume and get than it is to give. Whatever God says, Satan always trumpets out the opposite. We live in a world that will never encourage you to sacrifice yourself for the spiritual benefit of someone else. And yet that's exactly what God would want. He's pleased when our walk of faith overflows so that our lips and lives are filled with good words for both God and men. This pleases our Lord, and that's why we're here to please him. You know, something else that backs this up, we can go to 1 Peter. This is consistent with what we read in First Timothy, notice chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the unsaved, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, Glorify God in the day of visitation. This really backs up what was said in Matthew. The day of visitation is the day they get saved. That's what that term means. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it's the king of supreme or to governors or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. How you conduct yourself is being observed by the unsaved. And you can be used by God to be a testimony or actually then, or do the opposite, detract from what Christ wants to do in reaching the lost. And so when you think of good works, do you realize that good works are, are a part of the reason that you are not in heaven today? because God has left you on this planet to fulfill? I mean, we tend to think that we're here for something else, don't we? I'm here for other reasons, and usually when we think like that, we're in the center of all those reasons. And yet God says, whoops, whoops. I thought I had the, 
I had Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 up here, but I don't know what happened to it. So we're going to have to go there. Well, we know that. We know, who knows what Ephesians 2, 10 says? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared beforehand good works for you to walk into. This is why he's left you here. He didn't leave you here so you can make your mark so that everyone could, you know, stand up and take notice of what a great, you know, tiddlywink player you were. And there's nothing wrong with tiddlywinks. My point is this. God left you on this planet to make a difference in light of eternity. He's prepared good works ahead of time for you to walk in. That's what gives your life purpose and value in light of eternity before the Lord. It's amazing, isn't it? So good works are part of the reason you're not in heaven today, but good works are to be the result of learning and applying the word of God. If you go back to 2 Timothy, notice verse 3, excuse me, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. To what end, verse 17? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. One of the reasons that we are to learn and apply the word of God is so that we become equipped to fulfill the good works God has left us here to do. As you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God which has everything to do with good works and fulfilling them. So that leads to the next section here. What is considered by God to be a good work? Let me give you a definition. A good work is an activity done by one of God's people for God's sake in God's will and through God's power. A good work is an activity done by one of God's people for God's sake, in God's will, and through God's power. Now, what does good mean? I didn't put this on your handle, but you can write it down here. There's two different Greek words translated good in your New Testament. Agathos and kalos. Agathos is used 107 times in the New Testament. And this is good in the sense of beneficial or useful. So when you see good works, think in terms of beneficial and useful. It's a useful work, something that's useful, beneficial to someone else. Now there's another Greek word, kalos, and it refers to something that's intrinsically good, noble or honorable, whether it's used that way or not. In other words, we've got good ground here. Now, whether we use the ground is one thing or not, but it's good ground. It's intrinsically good ground. This is good wood, right? Knock on wood. Good fruit, good wine, good shepherd, God's law is good and so forth. Those things are intrinsically good. And so, when we think of good work, think of something that's either intrinsically good or beneficial or useful. And so a good work is something that's beneficial, useful, intrinsically good, noble or honorable, but again, done by one of God's people for God's sake and God's will through God's power. So how does this differ from an unsaved person or a carnal believer? or a legalistic believer. Now externally, they might not look any different at all. They might look the same. They might have the same result. So where's the difference? I mean, I could walk an old lady across the street, and the unsaved guy could walk the same old lady across the street in the same way, in the same way. What's the difference? One honors God, potentially the other. There's no way it'll honor God. 
And so the difference is primarily internal. Because externally, again, they can look identical. Because divine good is produced in the life of a believer in contrast to human good produced in an unsaved person. And so as we think of the difference, first of all, the person. You got the unsaved versus the saved. Every unsaved person, as good as he might do on a human level, is considered a filthy rag to God. It's unacceptable because what does Romans 3.12 say? All have turned away. Together they become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so you can have an unsaved person on a relative comparison be an outstanding individual. But it's a filthy rag to God. He can't accept it because it comes from the sin nature. There it is. But notice, we are his workmanship. We are created in who? Christ Jesus for good works. Since we're in Christ, the potential now to do something good and honorable to him is there because it's him working in us and through us to see it done. We're wired for sound, if you will. And so the first thing is the person. Regardless of what an unsaved person does, it's unacceptable to God. The next thing is the motive behind what you're doing. If your motive is to earn something from God, to gain his favor, or to be seen of men, see what a great thing I did there, thank you very much. Or is it divine good because of salvation or for God's sake or God's glory? And I see that, go to Ephesians chapter 5 for a second. This brings us out, Ephesians 5. No, pardon me, Ephesians 6. Pick it up in verse 5. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling. Notice, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Now with eye service as a men please. In other words, I'm only working when the boss is looking. But as a bond servant of Christ, to see yourself as the Lord's slave, you're doing the will of God from where? The heart. And you're doing it with good will. And you're serving. And here's the key, verse 7. As to the Lord and not to men. Because verse 8 says, Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. So the issue is, you see yourself as serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That means any undesirable task can all of a sudden become desirable because it's not about you, it's about honoring your Savior who loved you and gave himself for you. So the worst thing that you'd ever want to do if you do it as on to the Lord makes a difference because my motive is not what can I get out of this? My motive is how can I honor the Lord in this? Huge difference. This is why Colossians 3.23 says whatever you do Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Changes everything. The motive is very crucial. When it comes to Jesus Christ evaluating our lives at the judgment seat of Christ, your motive is a key thing. Who are you doing it for and why? And this is why love is so important. 1 Corinthians sixteen fourteen says, Let all that you do be done in love. Love changes everything. 2 Corinthians 5.14 tells us, the love of Christ compels us, motivates us, empowers us. The unsaved can't do it in a love that honors God. And you can do something out of duty and do the right thing and look externally and God says, that smells because you're not doing it in love, you're not doing it for me, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. There's another issue regarding the standard. 
Is it according to human opinion or is it according to God's will? You know, what the world says is a nice thing to do it might not be the very thing that God says is the right thing to do. They might do nice things. They might think it's nice that, you know, for example, as I'm thinking here, if I know someone's an alcoholic and they're starving to death, I might not give them $20, but I might give them a meal. Because if I give them $20, they might just take it and I might be enabling them to do something that I know is not good. And the world might say, well, you aren't loving at all. You didn't give that guy 20 bucks when he needed it. He's starving to death. There's some wisdom there. We need a standard to determine what is good, and the Word of God is our standard. And we live in such an immoral world. What the world says is morally good. You might say, no, that isn't morally good, and you might be defamed for it. But the issue is, what does God want? Not, what does the world say is good? And so the standard is, is this true to the word of God? Or am I compromising something I know to be true? Because it's, the world says that would be very good. Regarding the power source, was it produced through the flesh or produced by the Holy Spirit? See, the unsaved person or the legalist produces works through the flesh, human wisdom, human power, human achievement. This is why Paul said, what? For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. I have a desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. In your flesh dwells no good thing. Nothing good dwells in me, so if I do something in the power of the flesh, God cannot honor it. This is why he's given us the Holy Spirit. So Paul said, this in 1 Corinthians 15.10. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, but not I. The grace of God was with me. In fact, turn over to Colossians chapter 1 for a second. Notice verses 28 and 29. Paul here says, Christ we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according notice to his working, which works in me mightily. I strive according to his working. The labor I do is according to the working of God's power, God's grace. Paul here is underscoring the power source. Good works are produced by the believer's labor enabled by the Holy Spirit. And so those are the things that make a good work, good work. You know, in Christ even acknowledged some good works. Let's just look at one here. Go with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Notice verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. And then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. You want to be criticized? Do something as unto the Lord. Someone will criticize you. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done, notice, a good work for me. You have the poor with you always, and whatever you wish, you may do good to them, but me you do not have always. She's done what she could. 
She has come before him to anoint my body for burial. She has done a good work for me. It was done for the Lord. It was done out of gratefulness for the salvation that she received from him. So here we have the act is good because of the motivation behind it. And Christ was in view. You know, the issue isn't necessarily how much you do. It's what you did and how you did it. Were you faithful to the opportunities God gave you to minister for the glory of Jesus Christ? And you can forfeit a full reward by failing to use the opportunities that God gives you. You know, we're all either going to have a pile of wood, hay and stubble, or some gold, silver, and precious stones. And you know, your fellow man might evaluate your life and think, well, they didn't do much, but you know what? Your fellow man isn't the standard. God is. So I saw this this week. Life is short, eternity is long. As you serve, choose the right materials. Not a bad thing to have posted on your fridge, is it? Life is short. We can't do anything about what's gone on already today, but we can make a difference in the next five minutes going forward. And we can make a difference tomorrow. And the next day, until the Lord tarries, until he calls us home. But eternity is in it. I asked in the beginning of the message, why does it matter? Does what you do matter? What difference does it make? You can make a difference in every minute of your life for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're humbled as we consider why you left us here and why our lives matter. I pray that we try to focus on eternity to focus on the things of Christ, who is our life. Help us to set our affections on things above and to set our mind on eternal matters, to recognize that we aren't the center of the universe, but you are. And may we have the mindset of the Apostle Paul who said, I don't care whether I live or die, I've got one objective, that Christ will be magnified in my body. May we think the same way so that we can take advantage of the opportunities you give us to serve in time and to make a difference for all eternity. Thank you for your grace and the spirit of God that makes this all possible. Thank you for the word of God that we have to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May our hearts be humble. May we be yielded vessels unto honor, fit for the master's use as you see fit. So we thank you for the study tonight. We trust you've been honored in it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.